Uh, how big of a game is tomorrow night's game for the Eagles? Is John McMullen, McMullen ready to say it's a must-win game? We'll bring him into the conversation now, John. I don't think he's ever said that. No, and he's usually a pretty rational guy. So if he says, yes, this game has a lot of implications, uh, then you know it's a big game tomorrow night in Green Bay. The Eagles four-and-a-half-point doggy dogs on the road. You go to one and three, you got the Cowboys ahead of you in the division. If they were to win tomorrow uh, or on Sunday, they'd be four and oh, you'd be one and three. You got a lot. We talked a lot yesterday about the depth of the NFC. What is the feeling going into tomorrow night's game, John? How important on a scale of one to 10 is this one? Well, I, first of all, I want to dive into this Mosher thing. Is this true? <laughs> He's playing hooky. I mean, that's, that's is, there, the... is there a time stamp on the photo? Because you know, anybody can throw a photo. You have chain of custody. You got to make sure the evidence can can pass muster. But yeah. if he's playing hooky, that's come on. This is very similar to the Colangelo burner accounts, where there's just evidence starting to stack up against <laughs> Mosher, and and we're putting the pieces together over here. So it's it's not looking good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, like he he said that his car broke down. He's claiming it was a battery issue. To which, you know, Ryan suggested it could be he just ran out of gas and was embarrassed. And then I said, well, maybe he's just at the beach because it's a beautiful day. And then one of our listeners sent us a picture. It oddly looks like Chris Christie in a beach chair, but Jeff Mosher's head <laughs> is on that photo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. Uh, is, are you guys going to put that on social media? Oh, it's out it's, there. It's, it's out, out there, there, man. You, you got to be check. the judge. All right, I gotta I, I gotta do my own digging on this. There but as go. far as the Eagles, no, it's not a must win. Come on, it's week four of the NFL season. I, I think you can say, you know, you start thinking about wild card if the Cowboys do go to four and zero, mainly because of the division and uh, obviously they've already taken care of business with some of the bad teams. But that that puts you in a position where. They still get to face those Giants and Redskins two more times. You get to face the Eagles twice. The Eagles almost would have to sweep them, uh, and they're a good football team. So it's not like they're going to lose a, a ton of games in a row and come back to the pack. So I think from that standpoint, maybe you start shifting gears, and I think that would be a disappointment because obviously this team – has pretty lofty goals, and you don't want to start talking about wild card after you play a month of the season. But maybe that's where they are. Yeah. Good news is I think they got a really good chance to win the game. And we will uh, certainly dive into those reasons why uh, in just a second. But, you know, the, the one thing is, and we kind of looked at the schedule, and I hate to be like, you know, hey, going down the road because injuries happen, things happen. They got a brutal stretch coming up where they're on the road for three straight. And then even when they come home for three straight, you've got Chicago, the Patriots, and I can't remember who the third team is in that mix there. Uh, the third team that they play is the Patriots. Oh, the Seahawks. So, Yes, late in the year, Miami, the Giants, Washington, Dallas, and the Giants. There's a five-game stretch there where you can maybe pick up some, but that stretch to get there, there's three straight on the road, John. Vikings, Cowboys, Buffalo, and then you come home for three. Bears, Patriots, Seahawks, there's a buy in there too. But that's why I feel like this game becomes more important when you look at how the schedule is actually stacked. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's fair because if you look at it on paper, the Eagles wanted to make some hay early in the season uh, when the schedule didn't look as difficult. But, uh, you know, the old cliche in the NFL is it's not who you play, it's when you play. And, and the opposite of the Eagles, the inverse, you know, if you're talking to Detroit, they're probably saying, well, we're not going to win that game uh, coming into Philadelphia. Uh, and they probably wouldn't if the injuries didn't take hold. So you never know what's going to happen. What looks difficult today can all of a sudden turn very easy with a key injury or two. So, I, I you know, teams constantly preach, every team, not just the Eagles. Uh, they compartmentalize by week. It's all about the Packers this week. They'll move on to the Jets after the mini buy. Nobody's looking forward, nor should you, for that exact reason, because you don't know what's what in this league. And as I said, from an inverse fashion, the Eagles have proven that to the Falcons and the Detroit Lions because they thought 
Uh, and both games were tough, by the way, and I think that's actually a feather in the Eagles' cap that they were able to stay close and have a chance to win both games, especially Atlanta on the road. But things change drastically, and it happens every every year in this league, every week there's significant injuries. So you you got to wait and see to see how tough those games are going to be when they get here. John, we talk about must win, and clearly it's way too early to deem any game a must win. Mathematically, we all can do the math. Plenty of games left here, but a tough loss at home against Detroit on a short week. For me, I I can call it a must win, not because of mathematic or standing purposes, but just to put that loss at home against the Lions behind them. Like, I I don't want to see a snowball effect, and maybe I'm wrong here with, with all of that. You're around the team every day. How's the morale in the locker room? Is that a real far-fetched potential? Yeah, I think it is for a couple reasons. One, they didn't have time to think about that game. They didn't even watch the film. They immediately dove into the Packers because of the short week. Uh, so that's a little bit of a positive, uh, the fact that they there was no other option, and that's what these short weeks do to you. Uh, you can't look back. You can only look forward. So, uh, almost by necessity, they had to turn the page. And then this is a veteran team with a ton of veteran guys that have been through this. They've been through it two years in a row, to be honest. Uh, when Carson went down in Los Angeles back in 2017, I always say month, that Monday, the next day at the Nova, it was like a morgue. It was like a wake. Uh, the MVP, the potential MVP, the likely MVP goes down. Uh, at the worst possible time in the last month of the season. Uh, guys had to lift themselves back up, and they obviously did. Uh, last year, it looked like the season was over. We were joking <laughs> that Doug stopped practicing, uh, and the Eagles were kind of playing out the string, and all of a sudden they got hot. Uh, the Other things fell their way, and, and they make it into the playoffs. Not only make it, they win a game, and they're in it in New Orleans. Uh, And who knows if not for an Alshon Jeffrey drop. So my point is they've been through these ups and downs plenty of times over the last two years. And and these veteran guys are, are, they're, they're, they're not going to get emotional and they're, they don't get emotional for good reason because there is going to be adversity in the NFL season and pretty much good teams are defined by how they handle that adversity. You know, you mentioned Alshon Jeffrey, and he's expected to play tomorrow night in Lambeau. So I want your thoughts on the impact of A.J. returning uh, for Carson Wentz and what that means for the team and how that changes the game plan. Obviously, it changes it drastically, but his impact and how big of a game is this for Carson Wentz? If he goes out and balls out, we're all going to give him the praise. If he goes out and throws a couple picks and looks ugly and now they sit one and three, You know the storm's coming, fair or foul. Yeah, I mean, Carson talked about that this week. That's just life of an NFL quarterback, any NFL quarterback. And they get more credit when a team wins. They get more blame than they deserve when a team loses. Uh, And and they all know that. They all know that's part of the job. And I think from a quarterback standpoint, the more important thing is to handle success. And when everybody is praising you, and everybody is telling you how great you are to realize that you're just a, a cog in the machine and that if your your teammates aren't aren't lifting you up as well, uh, you, you're not going to look that good. And I think the great quarterbacks understand that. And they're able to keep their ego in check a little bit uh, and move forward. And, you know, to date, I think Carson has played very well. Uh, and, and kept them in games that maybe they shouldn't be. We talked about all the drops, basically 20%. You know, ESPN has been keeping those statistics since 2006. Uh, and so it's not a ton of years, but it is 13 years, so it is a pretty significant range. Uh, and that was the fourth worst performance over that range ever as far as dropping the football. Uh, so that kind of thing doesn't happen uh, very often, and that's why it's so important that you get somebody like Alshon Jeffrey back because that means you're less reliant on 
uh, Mac Hollins and J.J. Ortega Whiteside, and hopefully when Sean gets back, which is projected to be week five, you don't have to rely on those guys at all. Uh, that's what you want. Yeah, and it's when those drops are happening too, John. The four drop passes in the fourth quarter when your team is trailing by one point. So all four drops have come in the last two minutes. Hollins, Arthigo Whiteside, Aguilar, and Sproles. And a lot of them are coming at big moments of the game. And, you know, I see people that were uh, tweeting at us. Why is there always an excuse for when? Six and nine in his last 15 starts, four and 14 with a chance to win the game on the final drive. Well, if he doesn't have the drops, then he probably doesn't have the, the last. He probably they're looking at a team that's, that's possibly 3-0 and o right now. Yeah, I mean, I, there's times, and uh, you see me on Twitter, I, I, I don't understand people. I really don't. I, I, <laughs> first of all, I, I mean, what are, you, what are you throwing out, quarterback wins and losses, uh, as, as a statistic? I mean, people got to be smarter than that at this stage, don't they? I feel like you and Aton <laughs> should have this conversation. <laughs> I, I well, it's 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 all it's silly. It it's really a factor. Is. I think it's a factor, John. I mean, it's it's winning is everything, and the quarterback is the most important position on the team. Well, winning is everything. But even if if Tom Brady is is on the Miami Dolphins, guess what? They're not winning games. I, I mean, look, Tom Brady is the greatest quarterback who ever lived. I'm on record as saying that. Uh, <laughs> But New England does a good job in other areas as well uh, that helps Tom accentuate uh, what are uh, amazing strengths as a player. But again, if you put him on the Miami Dolphins, he is not going to succeed. But that's an extreme example, is it not? Like, I I agree with you, but when it's not that extreme and you have two quarterbacks who are similar in skill set and one's one's winning and one's not. When... When you're able to put teams in vacuums and everybody has equal surroundings, equal injuries, equal talent, then maybe it would mean something. But that's not what the NFL is. You can't call it, and I'm not saying you called it, but everybody in this industry calls it, the ultimate team game, and then boil it down to, oh, my quarterback's better than your quarterback. And so many people do that. It, it's it's insulting to the other 52 guys, 45 on game day, who are working their you-know-what's off uh, to win a football game. I, and I always – we talked about Eli a lot because he got benched and we were having the Hall of Fame conversation. I, I mean, think about Eli Manning if David Tyree doesn't exist and catch a football on his helmet, <laughs> and then in the other Super Bowl, Mario Manningham doesn't make that great catch. All of a sudden, he's got no Super Bowls. Is he a different player? Because those two guys made spectacular plays at the biggest moment? No, he's the exact same guy. No, I, and I tend to I, – I agree more with, with your your side. I mean, it's like the whole Eli Manning thing. The guy's about a 500 quarterback. If you are an elite, elite quarterback, most of the guys – uh, Breeze is not a 500 quarterback. Roethlisberger is not a 500 quarterback. Rivers, they're, you know – there, he's... Well, Drew, Drew's a perfect example as well, and I'll tell you, there was that three-year stretch where the Saints were making bad decisions. Sean Payton was suspended. Greg Williams, Bounty Gate, and they were seven to nine, seven to nine, seven to nine. Drew Brees was still Drew Brees. He was still that guy, but they had a bad team. Steve Spagnuolo was there. They had the worst defense in the history of the NFL, and they were seven and nine. So that kind of tells you, if you have the worst defense in NFL history and you're capable of lifting your team up to win seven games, you're a hell of a quarterback. (laughs) But, you know, people, certain people are going to look at at a quarterback going seven and nine. They're not going to put the context on that. Yeah, but guess what? The very, very very good ones don't stay seven and nine. You know what I'm saying? No, and, and, and exactly. Because, but a lot of it has to do with, Again, you add talent uh, around, and you and you start making better decisions. And and the Saints again, a perfect example. They get defensive players in there. They get Cam Jordan. You, you get Lattimore. You get those guys in that secondary. And all of a sudden, you have a middle of the road defense, and you're right back to being a great team. So that's the sliding scale. 
there's no doubt great quarterbacks, and again, that's where I say, if everything's in a vacuum, a bad quarterback with that Saints team that had the worst defense is probably winning. John, the, the, everything isn't in a vacuum. Yeah, and, and one thing here is, okay, so uh, the drops have been an issue. Wentz, uh, obviously, um, you know, his record 6-9, 4-14 and, nine, uh, four and 14 late in games here. So oh, do we overvalue, overrate some of the talent on this team just because we're around it so much and they won that Super Bowl? Do we say, look, this team is a lot of the same players that won that Super Bowl? Do sometimes we look at that team and overvalue and overrate them? Oh, no question. Well, I'll give you a perfect example of that. Somebody, and I'm not going to out them, uh, somebody asked, could this offense be, and it's weird, could this offense survive injuries? We talked, uh, I think the reason he brought this up is we talked a lot about at some point this season, you kind of knew Deshaun Jackson was going to go down. Uh, You hope for it's only for two, three games with a hamstring, turned out to be an abdomen, and you hope that's it. But his history says he's going to miss a couple games. So the question was, could they go without Deshaun and all Sean Jeffrey? And because all the hype surrounding J.J., and you go back to, for whatever reason, I have no idea why people thought Matt Collins was a good player in his rookie season. Uh, He's just an average player. He's a good special teams player. Could they still have a great offense? We have your answer now. (laughs) No. Those guys, I mean, starters are starters in this league for a reason. So, yeah, I, I think people overrate the talent, but they overrate the depth. Uh, and, and the depth on this team is not nearly as good as, as a lot of fans think it is. Uh, it's better than most teams, mm-hmm. but most teams can't handle this in, well, and, these injuries. And Doug was asked the other day about the fact that they're, they're, they are getting to be becoming an aging roster, that fine line. You know what I mean? That fine line of – when these guys lose that step and when they don't, you know what I'm saying? Like that you're 30, you're right there. You know, the, the Andy Reid era always just said, I don't care how good you are, you're gone for the most part. Very few exceptions. Uh, this team here, maybe they're not losing a step, but they're, they're, they're getting hurt because they're older. Yeah, I think it's more of the injuries and it, it, because it's been – pretty consistent and i know some people want to blame the medical staff but i I think it's age i really do um yeah i mean that's part of it and that's why it makes these are difficult decisions so but then you have you know the same people will will blame the eagles for being a little bit too old and i I, as i said i think maybe that's uh, at least somewhat of a fair criticism. And then in the next sentence, they'll talk about the pass rush and why did you move on from Chris Long and Michael Bennett? Uh, two of the aging, the more aging players on this team uh, who might look good if they're healthy and playing, uh, certainly, but, you know, one's 34, one's uh, uh, not retired, uh, obviously. Uh, and there's a reason he's retired. Mm-hmm. Uh so you can't have it both ways. I, I, I think logically this team believed the championship window was open, and that's why when you go with more veteran players. So I think the decision-making is sound. I think if you're a bad team, if you're those Miami Dolphins, if you're the New York Jets, if you're the Washington Redskins, you should always uh, go to the side of youth because – it, what what is having a veteran player going to accomplish for you? Uh, for a team that had these expectations, uh, like I said, I, I think the decision making is sound, but I also think there's no question some of the injuries have to do with the fact that they have an aging roster. All right, uh, real quick before John McMullen heads out the door, three years, three and zero on the Thursday night games at Carolina a couple of years ago. Uh, so they've had some tough short week games. And Doug has figured out a way to do it. So, um, at Green Bay tomorrow, is this actually a good spot for them to be in, the fact that they get Green Bay on the short week? Well, something's got to give because you just mentioned Doug's record. Uh, The Packers have never lost at home on Thursday night with Aaron Rodgers. So, something's got to give. The home team on Thursday night is typically in a good spot. Yeah. 
Yeah, and and they're typically in a good spot. I mean, uh, we just talked about wins and losses. If you want to just go by wins and losses, when Aaron Rodgers starts, they tend to win at Lambeau Field uh, throughout his entire career. Uh, so, so, as I said, something has to give. I, I look at this team and I look at each game and I'm talking about the Packers, and I really don't think their record is as impressive as people think it is. Uh, they struggled mightily offensively uh, against a very probably the best defense in the NFL, the Chicago Bears. Um, so you can't blame them that much. Uh, probably a bad Kirk Cousins decision away from losing uh, to Minnesota at home, uh, and then Denver is a really bad football team. Uh, so I don't I don't think their record is nearly as impressive. And it's interesting, things have flipped. The defense has been talented. But, again, you look at those teams. Chicago, Mitchell Trubisky has been awful uh, early in the season. Picked it up a little bit against Washington. Denver's got one of the worst offenses, Joe Flacco, we all know. Kirk Cousins is playing horribly with the Vikings. They do have Dalvin Cook. So, again, if you break it down, not that impressive. Uh, I think the Eagles, all Sean Jeffries back, Dallas Goddard's back. And not only that, Doug has said they're in the game plan. They're full goes. It's not like last week where Dallas is only going to be in there for nine snaps. They're getting healthier. I, I, I think this is a dangerous game from the Packers' perspective. All right, he's John McMullen. He'll be back tomorrow with a pick for the game and much more. And, of course, at J.F. McMullen on Twitter. Give him a follow there. And you can hear him on many platforms here on 97.3 ESPN. Uh, are you on the pregame show tomorrow night? Uh, I am. I'll be calling in, though. I won't be live because it's an abridged a edition. Yes. We yeah. are 6 to 7 tomorrow night for the countdown to kickoff with Tony Bruno. And uh, that's a Tony Bruno Harry Mays extravaganza for the <laughs> pregame tomorrow night. Uh, those guys do a great job. Of course, Colin Thompson and John McMullen, a part of the countdown to kickoff crew right here on 97.3 ESPN with Tony Bruno. Appreciate it, pal. Hey, thank you, guys.